Hi, welcome to Global Connections. I'm Liza Ryan from the East West Center, and I'm filling in for Carlos Juarez, who is at the moment in Austria um, doing a Fulbright professorship and will be gone until the end of June. So tonight we have uh, Jordan Dolier joining us to talk about bridging the educational divide. And thank you so much for, for coming, Jordan. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. And Jordan is now a teacher at Kamaili Academy, but he is, you're born and raised in yep. Hawaii and went to school here, went to Claremont McKenna for your undergraduate and then did a master's in teaching and education, right, at, mm -hmm. at the University of Hawaii. Um, so where did your passion for education begin? Um, it started growing up here. Mm -hmm. My passion for education is very specific to education in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, Growing up here, uh, I had the huge opportunity to go to Punahou, and I felt like I was also in the most beautiful state, the most beautiful place on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt very blessed, um, and I knew that a lot had been given to me, a lot had been provided for me. And every single year, at the start of the school year, um, the president of our school, Dr. Scott, um, always said, he had this big speech at the beginning of the year, and he would say, to whom much is given, much is expected. And that always resonated with me because I was like, whoa, I've been given some stuff. Like, so I, I need to make sure that what I've been given is put forth to the world. Um, and that always went straight to education um, because through working with band, because um, I was a trumpet player in high school, I got to uh, work with a bunch of students across the state. I would, was in uh, states like bands, states like orchestras. and I, So I got to meet a lot of people. And I realized very quickly that while we were all very similar, there was like truly no difference. I mean, I was, I was not a, I was working very hard to even compete with the rest of these, like just such good trumpet players out there. Um, and all other instruments, which is not yeah. to say. Um, we were all wonderful people, but there was not an equity of opportunity. Mm -hmm. I was simply, the opportunities educationally provided to me were somewhat different. Um, and there are no difference in ability, um, no difference in the people, but simply in the opportunities provided. Um, so. In high school, I remember uh, really committing to the idea that I need to come back at some point to this state and make sure that everyone has that same opportunity I did, where you're growing up in the most amazing place, but you also equally have the most amazing opportunities. And that to me meant coming back, working in education, and working as a teacher. And, and you started your kind of adventure in education, as it were, in with Teach for America, correct? Absolutely. Um, so I applied to them. And uh, I got placed out of school in YNI. So I was thrilled because that's exactly where I wanted to be. I wanted to work out in a place where uh, educational equity wasn't necessarily on par with the rest of the state. And I wanted to work in a place that was new to me, that I wouldn't necessarily have been a part of growing up in town, growing up in Hawaii Kai. Mm -hmm. um, and so I got to work at a school called Kamaile Academy um, mm -hmm. that at the time was a growing seventh and eighth grade school um, that was becoming a K-12 school. It was a really great opportunity that I sort of fell upon. Now, Kamaili is a public charter school. So when was it, when was it founded out in Waianae? So I don't know when it like, started, started. Yeah. Um, but it went charter. So I was in 09. So in 08, it had its first uh, charter year. So it used to be a K-6 school. It was mm -hmm. the, what you call a feeder school uh, for elementary. So it's just K through 6. And then the principal, who became the CEO, or chief uh, educational executive officer, um, he made it go to a what's called a conversion charter school. So mm -hmm. taking a school that is previously a public school and converting it to charter. And we worked under the charter management organization of Ho'oka Ko, uh, which is an organization that's a branch of Kamehameha Schools. And they help, because uh, if you go charter, you lose a certain amount of funding from the state. You still get some funding, per, what they call per pupil funding. Mm -hmm. um, but you get less, and the idea is that there's some other funder that's going to come in that like is going to be your board of education because you are no longer adhering to the specific board of education. Not any like negative like oh mm -hmm. you're lo losing the system or leaving us. Mm -hmm. It's simply that like if you're charter, you are having your own sort of checks and balances and your own board of education. Now that's been a conversation that is really um, be been persistent. I guess not so much in the last couple of years, but maybe four or five years ago, considering charter school vouchers. How, how do you see the charter school supplementing? Um, do you see it as a supplement to those that can't afford private school or that because of uh, Hawaii's, you know, public education has been deficient in many ways? Or how do you see charter schools functioning in, the, in, in Hawaii specifically? Sure. Um, 
the safe and what I, what I truly believe the answer to that question is is that charter presents an opportunity mm -hmm. I think making a sweeping statement and saying charter presents the private school alternative I think that's not necessarily fair I think it provides a different opportunity for administrators and school leaders and teachers to create an environment that is separate from what the Board of Education is doing in the state at regular public schools. Mm -hmm. Which is not to say there's not innovation at Board of Education schools and uh, district schools, but it provides just such a great degree to do something totally different. You are still assessed on the same standards, so to make sure that you are, you know, you're judged in a similar fashion. Um, but you have the Charter School Commission, so a different commission that you are reporting to. Mm -hmm. And you are allowed to create different and innovative programs. Like you can do whatever curriculum you'd like, uh, you can create whatever model you'd like and what you think would best fit students' needs. In a lot of different schools, that's creating phenomenal uh, results for kids. Um, it, just like there's phenomenal results for kids at public district schools. Um, but what it really creates is this opportunity to innovate. And that's where charter schools started, was the idea mm. for innovation, where people said, I want to, I have this grand design, let me try it out in school. Um, and, so and, that's, that, and that's, that's something that you have been recognized for uh, when you did your TEDx talk in Honolulu about a year and a half ago, two years now. Mm -hmm. um, that was really about you employ a kind of a, a different model in your classroom. And you teach, and you teach math, yeah. uh, 9 through 12, and algebra, pre-calc, trig. And so how do you, when you talk about innovation in charter schools, you know, is, is your job different at Kamaili Academy because it's a charter school than it would be if you were at a public school and teaching these same topics? Do you have more freedom or? I think in theory, yes. I think in practice, it can, it can change. I have an insane amount of autonomy and I mm. love it. Like I have the ability to create and enact exactly the dream of what I would like to do. Now there are checks and balances. I have an associate principal and a principal that I report to. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I'm just some freelance guy just like, all right, today we're gonna learn about horses. Like, it's, you know, there is curriculum um, that's given and at the same token, there's a bit of leeway that's given that isn't necessarily there at the district schools. But again, it exists there as well. Um, but mm -hmm. I think there's almost more of an expectation at charter schools to be a little bit different and its mm -hmm. purpose is to like try some things see what works and allow yourself to try things that may not work and mm -hmm. the idea truly that I think we need to grow towards is then share that mm -hmm. and that's what I feel like I've been blessed to have the opportunity to do is just try out different things and I've not always been successful <laughs> totally I'll be the first to admit it um, but I've had some things that have been amazingly successful and the way I've tried yeah. to create my classroom and what I talked about in the TEDx talk uh, which is sort of interesting and you say you know I teach math and I would say, yes, I do teach math. I'm technically the math teacher, um, but I would more so say math is the topic that is learned in my class, and I teach how to learn. Mm. And I feel like that's where education needs to go. That's where teaching needs to go, because the topics we learn in high school are valuable. They're interesting. They lead to different professions. They teach students about different scopes of the world and lead to different ideas of what they may become. But at the same token, what we really want students to end with is a desire to learn. And that starts with how you learn. And so the way I instruct in my classroom is what's traditionally called a flipped classroom, mm -hmm. where students, uh, there's actually video lectures of me teaching things, and students are allowed to go at their own pace. Now there's a suggested pace. I keep track of where the students are. Yeah. I have somewhat of what you would call a minimum pacing class. Mm -hmm. Tests are already scheduled ahead of time. But it allows students to go at a pace that is comfortable for them. And I, rather than am so uh, concerned with this idea of like standing in front of a class teaching new concepts, yeah. that already is happening. I'm concerned with motivation and addressing needs that come up with learning, teaching students coping strategies. Because in life, you're not always going to know everything. You are definitely not always going to have a teacher in front of a classroom. Like, let's say you go home and you're an adult and you need to put together a couch. Like, you're not going to be like, <laughs> all right, where's the couch teacher today, right? Yeah. And that's a thing that needs to get done, like doing your tax returns. There's not always going to be like, you're not going to have your tax returns teacher show up to your house. Mm. But you need to have the skills to learn. And that's what we have the opportunity to teach kids. That's what's so much fun about it, is you're teaching kids how to essentially how to grow. And it's a great feeling. And, and, and you said, you know, that you have implemented other, you know, methods that maybe have not worked. Could you give us an example of, of something that you've, that you've tried that didn't work? Sure. Um, uh, so 
there was one, so this is one of the uh, big ideas at our school, um, where we were sort of developing the program, especially when we first started. It was a bunch of, sort of like younger 20-somethings uh, that had this middle school. And so we got to create a lot of different programs that were really exciting. And one thing that we thought would be a great idea is having a what we called office hours time, which was we said, well, how about near around the end of the day, we're going to give students this ultimate freedom to just go around and like leave class and go to the, the teacher they need the most. And we learned very quickly <laughs> um, that that was a lot of responsibility mm. to just simply provide a way to middle school students. Now. Yeah. I'm not necessarily going to say that that was like a penultimate failure and that we should have never done it. We learned a lot from it. We basically mm -hmm. learned, like, you have to set up the expectations for it. There's yeah. a lot of things that we should have done ahead of time, but it's, it's that proving ground where you get to tr put out an idea, and then when it goes mm -hmm. wrong, learn a lot from it and say, like, well, that, that there are mm -hmm. elements of it that worked. Ultimately, it was a failure, um, and we stopped doing it. Uh, for the f future years, but it was an idea that helped us persist. Mm -hmm. It was this idea of allowing students to be individually in charge of their own learning, and trying an option that failed helped us realize, well, we want that end goal, and if we provide too much of leeway, too much of this open avenue, maybe that's not how we need to do it, obviously, yeah. in that case, yeah. but how do we do it then? And that's, I think, the most important thing I've learned at a charter school is uh, that it is the way you get better as a school program is by failing and allowing yourself to be comfortable with that and changing and adapting to it and growing from it to create a better program. Each mm -hmm. year I'd like to believe we're a better school okay. um, because as we, as we institute new programs, we reflect on them almost immediately and say what part of that went well and what part of that did not go well and let's keep the part that did go well and let's change the thing that didn't. And that is something that's really difficult to do when you, when you set you know, common core or national standards or state standards, you know, that best practice model and being able to self-evaluate is something that it c can be lost. Yeah. While it's great that we set a minimum standard, being able to evolve past it and innovate is something, you know, do you think that's sacrificed with those state or national standards? Uh, not necessarily. I feel like that's something that needs to come together with them. Mm. And I feel like this, the Common Core shift uh, has many phenomenal benefits in terms of the, the ideas and the ways of instructing and the ways of learning. Um, and I think with that needs to come this idea of a growth mindset where you're, just as I, I said, the, my goal and my job is, is to teach learning as opposed to teaching the content, which is what I'm in charge of. Um, we also need to do that with our teachers, and you need to teach people how to grow, and that it is acceptable to fail, because the job of a teacher can be scary at times. It feels heavy to have something go wrong in your classroom, and you do feel like a lot of eyes are on you, and you feel like sometimes maybe the public thinks you're not doing a good job, and if you have a bad lesson, then oh no, or maybe you feel like your principles are like going to be around the corner. Um, but we need to start embracing this. And so you feel like you're always on guard and you want to always present this, that every day went great mm -hmm. and that every lesson went great and every idea was great. And we all know that's not necessarily the case. And the best way everybody learns is through this trial and error and growth from that. And I feel like that's what we need to do with the Common Core. I think it is inherent because we are trying to institute something big and something exciting and something new. And we have to recognize that we are going to make some missteps we're going to yeah. make some mistakes. We have to be ready for them. And we have to not only be ready for them, but we have to love them and be excited about what we're going to make a mistake in and mm -hmm. be ready to change it and grow from it and know that that's going to make us better. Absolutely. And we're going to talk more about that when we come back from our break and talk about Jordan's philosophy of education. Thank you so much. Inspired by an ancient culture, classical Chinese dance, Vigorous physicality, timeless stories, 5,000 years of Chinese music and dance, Shen Yun presents authentic Chinese culture. Coming to Blaisdell Concert Hall, May 8th and 9th. Tickets at ShenYun.com or call 808-792-3919. Aloha, my name is Paul Jackson, better known as PJ and my local interest is in sports. I have my own sports radio show at KWAI AM 1080 that you can stream live. I also have my own website, pjsportsradio.com. 
we have live guests in studio and we talk about discussions and topics that everyone wants to know locally here on the islands. We cover everything from surfing to basketball to whatever's going on locally, sports-wise. We try to do our best and cover the topics in depth as much as we can. Once again, thank you for joining PJ here on Hawaii Sports Update. Mahalo. Thank you for joining us. This is Liza Ryan, uh, and this is Global Connections, and I'm filling in for Carlos Juarez, who's in Austria on a Fulbright professorship. professorship. And right now, we are talking with Jordan Dolier about his work at Kamaili Academy out on Waianae and his own personal philosophy of education. So thanks again for being here, Jordan. And we were just talking about what it means uh, to have a, a flipped classroom and to teach kids. Now, you teach math, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you were talking about how you don't necessarily teach math to your students. You teach them how to learn mm -hmm. because we're not always going to have someone around you know, to, to help us learn how we need to set up our own insurance or what kind of, you know, should we pursue another degree or is it more economically beneficial to be back in the workforce? Yeah. You know, there's, there's, no, there's no teacher to hold your hand in those times. So I would like to ask you just a little bit more about this. And you started, like I said, your adventure in education yeah. uh, with Teach for America, and which has recently come under some very strong critique. And I thought maybe if you could just Talk about that and what your experience was like working at the same school, but at one point for Teach for America and now just as a teacher kind of on your own without sure. that background. Um, so I think starting off in terms of like the philosophy of education, uh, a lot of things that I've learned in education were these big moments, right? And I think one big moment for me, when I first started, I taught as many people do uh, how you were taught, mm -hmm. right? So the way I instructed was how people instructed me. Um, and that was sort of my training in Teach for America. It was very, uh, there's, uh, I do, we do, you do, is sort of the structure where I do something in the front of the class, and then we all do it together, and then you do it yourself. Mm -hmm. It's like you're alone, so then we can see. That's how you sort of process the learning, is I shared something, we're practicing it, then you're practicing it, and then we'll see if you got it. Um, that's a very traditional way of going about it. And TFA has, one thing I do like about it, let's say, uh, before we get into that topic, is it has changed. It has mm -hmm. been progressive, and I think that's phenomenal. I think it's usually under-recognized that there are critiques against it. I've made plenty myself, but it adapts. It has, as an organization, taught many different things, um, and I can elaborate on that more later, but just especially Teach for America Hawaii, I've been thrilled to see mm. how they've responded to criticism, because I have been previously uh, a large cri uh, criticizer myself. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and what I can tell you is they listened and they changed. And so it's one of those things where I said, well, you're doing this wrong. And they said, okay, we've changed that. And I was like, well, that's okay. okay. <laughs> well, th that's, thank you. It's, mm -hmm. it was, it's, they're, just as we were previously talking about, they learn through mistakes and they know that it's a part of the learning process, mm -hmm. which is inspiring. And I feel like that's what an educational organization can aspire to be. In education, you don't aspire to be perfect. You aspire to be a perfect learner or trying to learn better and always mm -hmm. growing. And once mm -hmm. you stop growing, then I think you may have found your error. Um, but starting off, so like the philosophy, sorry, switching back. Um, when I started in there, I yeah. taught how I was taught, stood at the front of the room, um, and I used a lot of PowerPoints. I, you know, I was song and dance, had a lot of fun, especially with middle school students. Like, if you're really excited about it, like, today we're going to talk about fractions. And kids would be like, oh my gosh, fractions? Really today? Like, <laughs> and so it's fun, and you get to be yeah. passionate about it. You get to put on a show. There's a little bit of like the like fun, you're the star kind of thing. Like, yeah. this is how you do this. Um, and it was a moment, a lot of my learning in education has been through like conversations with family and my brothers. Um, and so I told my brothers about like, oh, I'm doing this today. Like, look at this PowerPoint I put on, like, this is pretty cool. Um, and one of my brothers said, uh, you know, that's, that's awesome. That's cool. But like, what happens when they leave your room? I was like, what do you mean? Like, mm. then they go to there. He's like, no, no, no. What happens next year? Like, what happens when they don't have you? Like, I mm. understand that you can make some great gains and that's phenomenal, it's not to be underestimated, what happens later. And that freaked me out, like it shook me to my core. Because I think mm. when you start out as a teacher, there's a ton going on, there's a lot you have to focus on, a lot yeah. more than you think going yeah. in. And so you just want to create this perfect domain and you're working towards it and you're failing and you're growing from it. And then once you've created what you think is going very well in your classroom, you feel 
confident and comfortable. Mm. And then I feel like the next logical step is to be pushed and say, okay, well, where do they go afterwards? Yeah. And are they okay afterwards? And so that's when I realized, like, well, I don't, uh, it was scared to say, I don't know. Mm. I don't know what happens next. I don't know how they will do. I'm certain they can operate in my structure. And the best answer I gave was, like, I'd like to believe that they will be better off because they've had me. And I, think, and I think they would be. But I wasn't confident enough in that answer. Mm -hmm. And it was something I reflected on. And I said, well, then what I need to do, even in just the one year I have them, is not only teach my content, but focus on just the aspect of learning and the excitement of learning. Mm -hmm. And while I do what I can, and I passionately teach math, and I try to get every student excited about math, I'm more excited about getting people excited about being alive. Hmm. You know, and excited about learning about how many different things are going on in the world and how much we can learn about and how we can go about learning about them. And in my class, when I start class, I'll generally have a tangent for a minute or two about something probably very unrelated. I talk about how large the universe is way too often. And I just think you want to, you want to impart upon students this love of learning. And then you want to make sure they know how to go about doing it. Mm. And I think if you've done that, they will yeah. be okay because yeah. they'll see this next subject. They'll see all subjects and all learning as growth opportunities because that's mm -hmm. what it is. When you learn anything new, you're a little bit better off. You grew a little, and that's thrilling. Like it's, yeah. Everyone has had that moment where you learn something new, and you're like, well, I need to share it with someone. You know, like, I, I'm sure I've uh, called a bunch of my friends, but like, I listened to this new podcast. I learned this new thing. Let me share it with the world. Yeah. I'm so excited about it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I feel like needs to be happening in every classroom because we have these topics and we have these students that are just minds ready to be excited and we need to not just excite them about what will be on this test yeah. but excite them about what will be on their life and how they can go about learning all these different things and using my class mm -hmm. as one way of teaching here's how you learn this and these methods will work later so that i can be more comfortable saying when they leave my class yes they know Algebra 1, but they also know how to learn, and they're a little, hopefully, more excited about being alive and learning more about that. Now, where you work, uh, for those that are not familiar with Oahu, uh, tends to be a somewhat socioeconomically depressed area of the sure. island that is not necessarily known for good schools or, or high-achieving students. And how is it, is how much of that factor uh, is a part of the way that you teach or part of uh, a part of the students' lives that you're working with? And how does that play into what then do you have to even more so lean on? What do you have to um, influence and impress on them more because of that? That you wouldn't necessarily if you were, say, you were working um, in Honolulu in one of our many private schools. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a general concept that I think every school, every teacher needs to abide by. And it is meeting people where they're at. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that I'm necessarily, I don't think by design I'm doing something massively different than if I was teaching at a different school. I think what is fundamentally important to understand is that education is a relationship between two people. And to make a strong relationship, you need to understand that other person, and you need to understand what motivates them you need to understand what is challenging for them. You need to understand what their barriers are, what their successes are, what their goals are, and how you fit into that relationship and what you can provide and also what they can provide you. Because I think too often education, you, you have a teacher who's, I am the great provider. And you forget that a relationship doesn't feel comfortable if you think that one person provides all the benefit and the other person simply receives it. Mm. And so, while there are challenges that exist that are not the same as some challenges at different schools, let's say, um, the fundamental concept is the same. I strive to understand my students, understand their needs, meet them where they are at, and help them grow from there. Um, and we have unique issues, as most schools do, is, is the true story. Mm -hmm. um, and I enjoy, I love my students to death and they have helped me understand how to teach. And I've had the opportunity of actually working with, this year is my sixth year with a wow. certain class of students. Congratulations. Thank you. It's, been, like, it's just <laughs> been amazing. And what it's really done for me is help me realize 
what their specific challenges they mm -hmm. face are. Um, which I won't necessarily, because I, I don't like this idea of like, oh, let's, I don't want to feel sorry for it, right? Because yeah. this doesn't help anything, but there are different challenges and to affect any learning, you need to understand them. And getting to know some students for that long, you get to see those barriers and then mm -hmm. hopefully work to grow through them. And I'll never forget uh, one in particular uh, was a student I was teaching in her eighth grade year. And this is my second year teaching her at that point. She's a senior now. Um, and I remember she was worked incredibly hard, incredibly driven. If she went to school with me at Punahou, I would be fighting to keep up with her in class. True story. She mm -hmm. is spectacular, inspires me every day, still to this day. Drives me crazy because anybody that you love is going to drive you a little crazy. <laughs> um, I think we all know that. <laughs> but spectacular student. I'll never forget. This was, this was a huge moment for, for me. I, I thank her for helping teaching me about this. Um, I thought she had everything going for her. Uh, she was driven to learn. She was succeeding at high levels. We were creating curriculum that was challenging. I was mapping my tests based on what I had been taught at Punahou. I was trying to contact teachers at other elite institutions and saying, what are your tests? I want to hold our standards the same because these students can perform at the exact same levels and mm -hmm. I will challenge anyone who will tell me otherwise. Um, and so I remember meeting with her, especially in eighth grade, and I was like, I'm so excited for you. This is just like after school, you know, just sort of hanging out. Like, I'm so excited for you. Um, you can do anything. And I told her that. I was like, you know, you can do anything. You can be anybody. You're about to go into high school. You can go to any college. You could go to Harvard. Mm -hmm. Like, you could go to Yale. You could go yeah. to anywhere you want. The world's your oyster, which is a metaphor I don't think she got. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that I get it, but it's a, it's a weird. Anyway. Um, and I was so excited for her, and she was like, she's like, well, yeah, but I can't really go anywhere. And I'll never, it was, it was weird. And I was like, what, <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? Uh, yes, you, like, you can go anywhere. She's like, well, no. Um, she's like, I'm not like you. Mm. And I was like, I, I was thrown off. Um, and I was like, what do you mean? She's like, well, I'm not smart like people from town. Oh. And I like, I didn't know how to react in that moment. I was like, I was so partially devastated and so just like shook it. I was like, what do you mean? She's like, I grew up here. Mm. I, well, I'll never be as smart as people that grew up in town. And that was something she believed. Wow. And it broke my heart because it like empirically was false. Yeah. I had, I had papers written, I had tests taken that proved that she's incorrect. And growing that relationship with her allowed her to open up and share that with me. And since that day, I have been working with her to challenge that notion. And I think it's important for us all to understand that, that she's not a unique case. Mm -hmm. And that is a challenge that exists in many places. But that is the value of an educator, and that is why education needs to be viewed as a relationship. Because that mindset is a challenge for her success later. Mm -hmm. And her getting to share that with me helped me understand that issue empathize as best as I could and work to change that mindset for the rest of her life through college and even her senior year we're still working on it but still yet she has applied to Harvard she has applied to Stanford she applied to all these places and she's excited about it yeah and that's where I feel like the value of an educator can come through absolutely and that's something that we've talked about and uh, recently, uh, even just discussing um, a current article in The Economist and talking about uh, education and educational divides creating a new aristocracy within mm -hmm. the United States. That, that is no longer necessarily has to do with blue bloodlines or, um, you know, being the science of, of a, of an, of some type of conglomerate, but it has even more to do with now that, you know, if you're an educated person who has a graduate degree, chances are you're going to marry another educated person who has a graduate degree, and you're going to put your children in a good school and then send them off to a good college, and then they will get a graduate degree. And we see kind of these these areas, educational, um, you know, it coming to a point and where fewer and fewer are having the ability. And even recently, now that uh, the United States uh, student loan debt is higher than our credit card debt, which nobody ever thought would be possible. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's way high. <laughs> is extremely high. And 
working in an area, and, and unfortunately, Hawaii kind of exemplifies this um, mm. to an extreme that you, you might not see in other parts of the country. Yeah. Um, you know, what is, what is your hope for those, those students? Do you think that they really can leave the West Side? Do you think, or that even if they went to one of these schools, that, they'll be, that they will be able to compete? Um, so, actually, let's let's talk about that right after we come back from a break. All Thanks right, so much, Jordan. Good. Aloha, yappers. This is your host Kingsley for the Yap Show. Every Friday, at 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Time, you can catch us here live. Think that Hawaii, and then later on, we upload to our YouTube channel. We talk about youth issues, policies, um, youth programs, and how to transition yourself into adulthood. Right. But this was like a sign, I guess. Hey, life's like, hey, right. now's your chance to go back to school, which uh, I'm doing. Catch us here again live, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Hunter Hevelin, host of Sustainable Hawaii here at Think Tech Hawaii. You can tune in every week on Thursday at 2 p.m. to see interviews with sustainability professionals from around the state and even further abroad, learning about activities with water management, food security, waste management, and a whole host of other uh, fascinating opportunities to get engaged with making a greener island. So if you're interested in making the transition from consuming individuals to communities of producers, check us out every Thursday. Hi, this is Liza Ryan from the East West Center, and I'm here with Community Matters. Uh, you may have seen me on a previous segment with Carlos Juarez in his show, Global Connections. And today we're talking with Jordan Dolier, a teacher out at Kamaili Academy, and about his perspectives on education and the lessons that he has learned uh, for over the last six years working out in Waianae and really challenging some of our notions of what it means to be an educator. And so, Jordan, we were just talking about the issue of uh, the disparity, the gulf between those that can access a higher education and that are really can take advantage of that and, and those that, that can't. And my question to you was, for these students that you are encouraging um, to go to university, what is your hope? What is, what is the future that you imagine for them that, that, that you would want them both to understand and also to achieve? Sure. Um. I would like them to be able to have the same opportunities I do. That's why mm -hmm. I got into this program. That's why I got into education. That's why I'm passionate every day. I want them to have the same abilities in their life that I have had. Um, and I also want them to understand, more specifically to my school, uh, the idea of kuleana, um, as we have taught it in our senior year, which is this understanding of how something special about you can lead you to provide for the planet around you. So that's mm -hmm. something that we impart upon them as they leave, is they need to understand their kuleana in the understanding that uh, what is their special gift uh, that is unique to them, that they are enabled to better the world around them. What are they responsible for? Um, and this could come in any, a variety of ways. I feel like my kuleana is the idea of education in the state, but for many others, it, it could be protecting the country through military. It could be uh, making people healthier through becoming a doctor. It could be for, for one girl in particular, It's truly making people feel special. And she wants to go into cosmetology and she wants mm. to teach people how to love themselves. And that is what she feels is her kuleana. So that's what I hope, is that our students have the same opportunities as anyone else. And they also feel this great responsibility for the world around them. Because that, that's, as that's personally what I believe leads to a happier, uh, better existence. Mm. And as we were talking about, uh, you know, one of the discussions that we've had is that sometimes when these students are put in high achieving or in a college surrounding, you know, like that story you shared, breaking out of that mentality that they are really not as smart as the, the other students that are in this environment, in, in a college environment, can be really damaging and distracting. Uh, is that something that also, you know, you, you're a math teacher, but you talked about wanting also to, you know, teach them how to learn. Is that something that you've addressed in your classroom, try, addressing that type of mentality as you, you know, push them out the door and hopefully they fly? <laughs> uh, I think the answer to that is sort of yes and sort of no, in that that conversation mm -hmm. is, I don't think it's a lecture. I don't think it's something that goes to 
uh, a group of students. I think it goes to each individual. And I've had a conversation of that regard to every single student I've ever taught. Mm -hmm. um, which doesn't mean I'm telling each of them that, because not all of them have that specific barrier of this place that I'm from is different from the place that is over there. But they all have different challenges. And so that conversation has always existed. And to readdress just what was proposed over break, uh, do I think that students from y and I and the students I teach can achieve the exact same levels and have the exact same success as anyone else in high school and college? Absolutely yes. Mm. Uh, I think there is no difference um, in the children that go to the school I teach at and the children that go to school at, let's say, Punahou, Nilani, Kamehameha, Mid-Pacific, the rest. Yeah. Um, I think what we need to understand, and this is sort of how I got to understand it, is what are these barriers? Um, and what is the reason that, let's say, you'll have a higher college going rate at one school versus another? And I think we need to stray away from comfortable notions of simply there's a common notion of laziness or uh, unpreparedness and see the root of an issue. And I remember I, I got to have a sort of first-hand account because I remember growing up when I was taught um, Grades were the biggest deal in the whole world, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if I didn't get a good grade, I was terrified that my mom was just probably just going to end me. Like that'd be it. If I got like a C, my mom would be like, "Well, this one's not worth it." Um, so that was just the big motivator yeah. for me. And so then when I started teaching, I was like, you know, that was what I thought. Everyone's motivated this way, right? That must be the only thing on your mind. Um, and so I remember going into class and a, a student was necessarily misbehaving, and I was like, "If you don't do this, it's going to affect your grade." And they looked at me like I was crazy. They're like. Okay. And I, in, my, in my head, I was like, how can you not yeah. care only about your grade? What else is going on? Like, mm -hmm. I was surprised because it was different from what I had learned. Mm -hmm. um, it was a growing moment for me because then I reflected on it, and I ended up doing my master's thesis specifically on student motivation. Because mm -hmm. I was like, how, this is, I saw that as a key thing. Like, how do you motivate students? How do you get people to want to learn? How do you make them intrinsically motivated to love learning? And one thing in particular I learned about was the idea of hygiene factors or things that need to be in place for someone to even be motivatable, let's say. Yeah. And I think this is where the job of a school expands. And it's challenging, but it's exciting. And hygiene factors are things like making sure you have your next meal cared for, making sure you have water, making sure you are loved, making sure you feel safe. And these are things that are not universal goods. And I think that is the big challenge. And I think that is the perspective that we all need to get when we look at education, that it is not simply a teacher is teaching better and that is giving this test score, um, which is not to let every teacher off the hook, let's say, but mm -hmm. it's that this is a deeper issue. It's the issue that has helped create one of the most massive successful educational structures in the Harlem Children's Zone, in the Promise yeah. Academy, where you have someone like Jeffrey Canada say, education is not just about a lesson and it's not just about a topic or a test it's about a life and a feeling of safety and it's about taking care of children and that's where i see education is we are not simply making sure students know facts we are taking care of children and to do that you need to understand them and to do that you have to have a going belief that everyone is doing the best with what they've been given and if a student is not behaving as you think they should, don't blame the student. Don't quickly say, well, this must mean this student is a bad one. Because I, yeah. I, as my six years, <laughs> I've not found the one. I've yeah. not found the bad one. Uh, and this is one thing I've always done to check myself, and this happened even recently. If a student's misbehaving in my class, I always have this, like, I pause, and I say, like, there's probably something else going on. And like, I genuinely have to check myself because it's very easy if someone's yeah. off task, off topic, to want to say, hey, what are you doing? Yeah. Like, and be like, this child is choosing to make mm -hmm. me mad. Uh, you know, like they woke up today, they said, in Mr. D's class, I'm going to like, I'm going to put my pencil over here so he's mad like this. <laughs> and so you just, you feel that and you want to get yeah. it back. Um, but I always check myself and say, there's probably something else. Mm -hmm. Talk with him outside really quick. A hundred percent of the time, this has ever happened in six years, there was something else. Mm -hmm. And I, this one broke my heart recently because I'm not a perfect person, I'm not a perfect teacher. Sometimes I don't do that as well as I'd like. And this is literally three weeks ago. Um, there was a student who was, she just wasn't working. She usually did and she just like didn't want to do work. I kept reminding her and then she'd be off task and like on like a different website 
rather than doing what she should have been doing, or uh, she was just, and I was just, it, I was, it was surprising for me, and I got frustrated, and I, I just kicked her out of class. And she was being, ne oh, that's too, she was being negative, which she rarely was. Mm -hmm. She was like, I don't even, this is way too hard to do. None of us are going to be able to do this. And I was like, you need to get away from other children. Like, that's a scare, <laughs> just don't tell anybody else that. That's the opposite of what I'd like you to believe. Yeah. Um, and so I kicked her out, and I was just like, I remember talking to her. I, 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 I genuinely feel bad about this now. Uh, and I, I've apologized to her, but I still feel bad about it. But I thought at school, I was like, I don't care what's going on. Like, you have yeah. no right to convince other people that they can't learn. Like, you are getting in the way of others learning. You have no right to take your needs above the needs of others. And I was very stern with her outside of class. And I was like, uh, and then, then she came back in and was like working, but it, was, it, it wasn't a great day. Yeah. And I was frustrated and she was frustrated. And um, she sought me out uh, later that day at lunch. And she's like, Mr. D, I just want to apologize for like really messing up your class. Um, my uncle died yesterday, and I'm really not okay. And I just wasn't focused on what we were doing. And I like, I broke down. I was like, <laughs> I am so like so genuinely sorry. Yeah. I assessed you on the wrong level. Mm -hmm. I didn't give you the benefit of the doubt. I assumed this was an issue self-contained within you. Mm -hmm. And I told her, I was like, I'm, I'm sorry. Like, I shouldn't have done that. She's like, no, 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 I was disrupting your class. It's okay. And I was like, <laughs> you're being very amicable and it's yeah. kind. And I feel like that, that issue is a larger one in that you look at a school, let's say, it's, it's very easy to say, well, this school is underperforming and this principal is underperforming or these teachers are. And I'm not trying to say let everybody off the hook yeah. But let's dive deeper as like a state and see what are the issues. Because mm -hmm. that's what I'd like to see us talking about is what are the challenges that are actually facing mm -hmm. these students? Mm -hmm. uh, because we talk about teachers need to be better. We talk about standards need to increase. Uh, we talk about principals potentially being overwhelmed. And those are all fair, valid. But I want to hear more conversation of how can we take care of a generation of children and what are the needs that they need met so that they can be motivated, so that they can succeed? And how can we as a state talk about that? What programs can we institute to help those needs? Now, speaking on that topic, you're about to leave Ireland in a couple of months here to mm. pursue uh, an educational doctorate. And in that, what are the areas that you are specifically, that you know, are burdens to you that you want to delve into as you do research on the practice of education? Mm -hmm. um, too many things is my problem. That's always okay, been my problem. Okay, two. We got three minutes but left in the program. One of the big ones is how to create change on a, let's say, state level. Mm -hmm. um, how to enact a change that exists for students and is bought into by teachers. Because I feel like that's the great thing we need here is we need unity, where we need ideas that are built from teachers that are supported through the entire system, where we grow, again, unity as a state. Because uh, mm -hmm. I feel like that is something that students learn from. If there's a divide in adults, students learn from that divide, and it creates divisiveness through and through. Your students are learning literally everything from you. So if you have a bad relationship with someone, they are learning that too. So a, a degree of unity in how we can create unifying policies to make everyone on board, um, which is not to say that there, anyone is specifically at fault. I just think that's what we need. We all need to be together on this. Um, and then also how we can go about promoting a growth mindset and a mm -hmm. way of teaching students learning. Growth mm -hmm. mindset is something that I believe in wholeheartedly and instructing on the excitement of learning and passion for something in particular. Because one thing I've been particularly focused on recently working with seniors is this idea of we send students K through 12 and as 18 year olds, um, a lot of them saying, well, what do you want to do in college? And they say, well, I'm undecided. And I, yeah. I think as a, as a state and as a country, we need to start saying that's not okay. Yeah. Let's get you excited about something sooner. Mm -hmm. We've had you for a lot of years. <laughs> Let's get you passionate about something. It doesn't yeah. need to be the thing you do for the rest of your life. There should be something that you're pumped about because we've just taught you a whole bunch. Well, I think you've uh, shared more than just your experiences in education <laughs> tonight, Jorda, but you've really shared your passion for it. And I can say that, you know, Hawaii has been lucky to have you for the last six years as an educator and that we hope that you come back here to share whatever oh, lessons absolutely. you learn in, the, in your next adventure in education. 
And thank you so much for being on Community Matters. This is Liza Ryan from the East West Center, and thank you so much for joining us.